Okay, so we're now going to switch to the next topic, inference. So the simplest form of inference is using a method called modus ponens. So the way it works is that if you have uh, a statement, let's say alpha, and we also know that alpha implies beta, you can infer that beta is true. So here's an example. If we know that uh, Martin is a cat, and we know that for all x, cat is x, implies eats fish x, we can infer from this that Martin eats fish. So inference can be done in many different ways. You can use forward chaining. That's when individual facts are added to the knowledge base, and then you derive all the possible inferences that uh, follow from those individual facts. And you can also use backward chaining. That's when you start from a query. For example, you want to find out if uh, a certain statement is true. And then uh, to figure this out, you have to go back to the database and find the statements that have to be true in order for your query to be true, and so on recursively until you reach statements whose uh, truth values are known. So backward chaining is implemented, for example, uh, natively in the Prolog programming language. So I'll just show you a brief example of Prolog. In Prolog, you can define the following uh, inference statement in the knowledge base. So x is the father of y means that it has to be true that x is a parent of y and that x is male. And then if you have the following facts, uh, John is the parent of Bill, Jane is the parent of Bill, Jane is female and John is male, all of this in your knowledge base, and you get a query that says, find me an M where M is a person who is the father of Bill. So using backward chaining, what you need to do is to go to the knowledge base and find that in order for M to be the father of Bill, there has to be statements with true values which say that M is the parent of Bill and that M is male. So going back, now we have to find statements about M being the parent of Bill. There are two possible instances of that, John and Jane. And at the same time, we want M to be male. So there's only one such statement, so male John. Therefore, the only combination of statements in the knowledge base that satisfies the query is where John is equal to M, which is also equal to X, and Bill is equal to Y, and therefore we're going to return that the value of M is equal to John. So now let's see how we can use first order logic for inference. I'm going to show you three examples from the kinship domain. The first one is to represent the fact that brothers are siblings. So how do we do this? Well, we say that for all X and Y, if X is the brother of Y, that implies that X is the sibling of Y. Another statement is, one's mother is one's female parent. Again, we can define this by saying there, uh, for O, M, and C, like mother and child, if the mother uh, is M, mother of C is M, that is the same as M is female and M is the parent of C. And finally, we want to be able to represent the fact that the sibling relation is symmetric. So that is represented in the following way. Uh, for O, X, and Y, sibling X, Y is equivalent to sibling Y, X. Now let's see how we can do inference in a little bit more detail. The next thing that I want to introduce is universal instantiation. So we can say that every instantiation of a universally quantified sentence is entailed by it. So if we know that for all V, alpha is true, we can infer that any substitution where V is replaced by a specific instance G is also true for A. So this is true for any variable V and any ground term, for example, constant G. So here's an example. For all X, cat is X, I mean X is a cat and fish is Y, implies that X eats Y. This can be represented as uh, in the following substitution. Martin is a cat and blob is a fish, implies that uh, Martin eats blob. Now an example of existential instantiation. For any sentence alpha and variable v and constant symbol k, which doesn't appear somewhere else in the knowledge base, if we know that there exists v for which alpha is true, we can infer that if we replace this v with a specific constant symbol k, the statement alpha is also going to be true. So for example, if we have, there exists a cat called x, and x eats uh, fish, we can represent this using c1 as a specific cat, the one that exists, and we can claim for that specific cat c1 that c1 is a cat and that c1 eats fish. Uh, by the way, this uh, special constant symbol is known in the logic field as a scholem constant. 
So let's talk a little bit about unification. So unification is done when you have a possible substitution. For example, if we have the statements P, which is X eats Y, and the statement Q, which is X eats blob, it's possible to unify those two under the substitution that replaces the variable Y with a specific object blob. Another example, if P is the statement Martin eats Y and Q is the statement X eats blob, it is possible to unify those two using the substitution X is Martin and Y is blob. Another example, if P is the statement Martin eats Y and Q is the statement Y eats blob, it's impossible to unify those two because we want to si simultaneously satisfy two substitutions. We want y to be equal to Martin and y to be equal to blob. And because Martin and blob are different, then the unification process is going to fail. Okay, so there are many cases where we can do unification. Uh, one is if we want to unify a variable with an object. Another example is when we want to unify two objects and they are the same object. Uh, it is also possible to unify two things if one of them subsumes the other one. So here's an example. We, if we know that all cats eat fish, and we know that Martin is a cat and Blob is a fish, we can unify those statements together. 